Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to call the April 4th meeting of the Environmental Resources Committee to order. We will start with item number two, the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, before proceeding to item number three, for staff, please mark Andrew Bensky excused. He texted me earlier. Thank you. Uh, item three, public comment. Uh, we have one uh, member of the public that wishes to speak. I have Fred Schindler. Um, given that there's only one, uh, you can have the entire 15 minutes if you like. Uh, that being said, I believe formality for the public comment is name and uh, address for the record. All right, I ask that you please state your name and address when you're ready to address us, please. We can probably hand these over. Yeah. Okay. Do I go over the speaker? Yes, please. The microphone back in the room. Okay. My name's Fred Schindler. I'm a Clark County supervisor. I live six miles west of Abbotsford out by the Curtis exit. I've been a Clark County supervisor for 17 years. Um, I have address, Fred. Yes, um, W twenty six forty two Matthias Street, Curtis, Wisconsin. Thank you. You bet. <clears throat> um, Clark County sponsored a resolution. I'm I'm not here to really ask this planning and zoning. Uh, that's um, what we call it over in Clark County. Anything specific. It's mainly a update of Clark County doing their best to work with Marathon County. We've created a, an alliance with Eau Claire County. Um, we've, uh, Columbia County has also been talking to us with the health, safety, and well-being of the townships, the residents, and the wind turbine, industrial wind turbine complexes that have been I was trying to be sited in the uh, western part of Marathon County and uh, also in the eastern part of Clark County. Um, Invenergy is in the Marathon County one. They're out of Chicago. Um, and in Clark County, it's RWE. They're a German-based company. But what the biggest problem, if, if you look at that one handout I gave you that shows a picture of the wind turbines. Uh, when the state uh, PSC 128 passed their setback ruling in 2012, the, the, if you see the buildings, the turbines were, then were 250 to 300 feet tall and now they're 600 feet um, and in a couple of years they're going to go to 825 feet and the setback has not changed. Um, there is more and more, as they get bigger, there's more and more shadow flicker, more vibration. Um, there is more health risk. There's more property value losses. And so there's there has been four townships in, uh, in uh, Eau Claire County, uh, Lincoln County, that they basically passed an ordinance uh, for two years ago. Um, the setback went from that 1250 to one mile or 10 times the height of the turbine. The decibels, they cut down from 50 in the daytime and 45 at night to 35. And then anybody, if there is a turbine sighted within a mile, um, they, um, if anybody up to two miles will get reimbursed property loss if if that occurs. And there's so many people that think that the state statute cannot be overruled. It can be overruled by a little tiny six by six township. It's being done in the western part of the state. There are definitely health and safety 
risk and issues to um, to these turbines, and um, it's it's up to the town members to um, do their best to protect the citizens of of uh, other townships. So, I any of you that I know you're county supervisors, but you're also if you're not a on your local towns, I would encourage you to go to your annual reorganization meeting, especially if you're in the western part, um, because there's going to be a lot of conversation and talk and on a kind of a block ordinance with an, as many as of the townships as that we possibly can get. There's three or four for sure in Clark County, and hopefully four to six in in Marathon County. So. Um, just appreciate you paying attention and supporting, um, watching out for the health, safety, and well-being of the citizens. So, thank you. All right. Uh, moving on, seeing as no one else wishes to speak for public comment today, we'll move on to item number uh for approval of the February 28, 2023 committee minutes. Motion approved be in order. Motion by Dravek, second by Shafinsky. Any further discussion? Seeing and hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, motion carries. Uh, moving on to 5A, 1 through 5. Um, public hearings review pass. Sorry, operational functions required by statute, ordinance, or resolution. A, public hearings, review, possible actions, and possible recommendations to the county board for its consideration, county zoning changes. Um, before we start, I'd ask that please everybody mute your phone, or if you're joining us electronically, please mute yourself uh, so as to not interrupt the discussion today. Uh, the Marathon County Environmental Resources Committee is now meeting in public hearing on the location, plan, specifications, and purpose of the following projects. 5A1, John uh, Sajomsky, Heavy Industrial to Rural Residential, Town of Reed. 2, Nathan Koss, General Agriculture to Rural Residential and General Agriculture to Rural Estate, Town of Knowlton. 3, David Willman on behalf of Travis and Troy Willman, Trustees of Willman Family Legacy Trust, LI Light Industrial to General Agri GA General Agriculture, Town of Spencer. 4, Larry J. Schuer, Trustee on behalf of Schuer Revocable Living Trust. General Agriculture to Farmland Preservation, Town of McMillan. Five, Jason Flieger on behalf of Merle and Esther Martin, Farmland Preservation to Neighborhood Commercial, Town of Hall. Um, just briefly here, I'll name the members of the Environmental Resources Committee, myself, uh, Supervisor Langenhan, uh, we have Supervisor Drabeck, uh, Rodney Roscoff, our FSA representative, uh, Supervisor Seafelt, Supervisor Overbeck, uh, Supervisor Shavinsky, Supervisor Unger, and Supervisor um, Ritter. Um, also present are Lori Miskimins, our Conservation Planning Zoning Director, uh, Shad Harvey, our Land Resource Manager, Nicole Delaney, our Administrative Technician, Garrett Poggle, our Land Use Technician. Uh, the establishment of the ERC is required by law for purposes of administration of county ordinances and land conservation programs. This committee must follow state laws and local ordinances as written. This committee cannot change or ignore any part of the ordinances or state laws, so must apply the laws as written. The purpose of this committee is to hear and decide on proposed ordinances and ordinance revisions, rezoning petitions, and provide direction on land conservation and planning programs. The ERC will give a full and fair hearing to any person applying for a rezone petition. A taped recording is being made of the meeting, which will assist with preparation of written hearing minutes. The committee is interested in hearing all pertinent comments and questions. Each hearing will be open by reading the public notice and allowing staff to present a staff report, including evidence from any on-site inspection. The applicant and anyone wishing to testify will be sworn in and allowed to give testimony. Witnesses will be called in order of those first in favor, second opposed, and then third as interested may appear. The committee may ask questions of the zoning staff and applicant. And it's for that very reason that if you are uh, an individual, uh, the, while testifying for your application is not a requirement, uh, it could be beneficial to provide testimony if the committee had any questions, uh, in which case it's just a matter of you coming forward and being sworn in. Uh, it is necessary that we set a reasonable time limit on individual statements on the overall length of the hearing. To promote orderly discussion, anyone wishing to present oral testimony or ask questions relating to the hearing should state your name and present your testimony or questions so it becomes part of the official record. We request you avoid repetition. 
Once the committee has all necessary facts, the chairman will close the hearing, allowing no further testimony, and the committee will deliberate and sign in front of the public whether the applicant has met the standards in the ordinance. No additional testimony from the public is allowed during the deliberation. However, the committee may question staff for purposes, purposes of clarification. After a decision is made, the committee will proceed to the next hearing. Many of the decisions made by the committee are a recommendation to the Marathon County Board of Supervisors, who will take up the matter at a future county board meeting. Contact staff for more information regarding this county board process, and we will get right into it this afternoon. The committee will now hear the application of 5A1, John Suchomsky, Heavy Industrial to Rural Residential Town of Reed, and uh, we'll begin with the staff report uh, with Garrett. Garrett, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Go ahead. All right, this is a petition of John Sukomsky, petition to rezone land, staff report April 4th, 2023, for the Environmental Resources Committee. The petitioner is John Sukomsky, residing at 169498 Kristoff Road in Hatley, Wisconsin, 54440. Property owner is John and Michelle Sukomsky, residing at the same address. Area to propose to be rezoned is located on the corner of Charlotte Road and Kristoff Road. The petition of John Sukomsky to amend the General Code of Ordinances for the Marathon County Chapter 17 Zoning Code to rezone lands from HI Heavy Industrial to RR Rural Residential, location described as part of the southwest quarter of the northeast quarter of Section 29, Township 27 North, Range 9 East, Town of Reed, property described as Lot 1 of recorded CSM number 19107, document number 1848380, parcel PIN number 0642709, 2910973. The Town of Reed Town Board met on March 14th, 2023. Marathon County Environmental Resources Committee is meeting today, April 4th, 2023, at 3 p.m. A legal advertisement was published in the Wasa Daily Herald. Notice of the zoning change request was also sent by regular mail to adjacent property owners within 300 feet of the subject property. The existing zoning district is heavy industrial. The existing Land use map for the Town of Reed from their 2007 comprehensive plan shows the area to be rezoned as croplands in the plan, co town's comprehensive plan existing land use map. Adjacent land uses are comprised of commercial, cropland, other agriculture, quarry and gravel pits, woodlands, and single family residential. Proposed zoning district is rural residential. The future land use map for the Town of Reed from their 2007 plan the area proposed to be rezoned is shown as cropland in the town's comprehensive future land use map. Adjacent land uses comprise of other agriculture, croplands, commercial, quarry, woodlands, and single family residential. The town of Reed does not participate in farmland preservation. This is the aerial photo of the property to be rezoned and the CSM associated with it. On March 14, 2023, the Town of Reed Town Board recommended approval to Marathon County's Environmental Resources Committee. Staff comments regarding ERC conclusions of law. Number one, the rezoning is substantially consistent with the following plans. Note how the proposed relates to the future land use plan and vision, goals, objectives, and policies of the plan, Marathon County Comprehensive Plan, Town Comprehensive Plan, and Marathon County Farmland Preservation Plan. Marathon County Comprehensive Plan relies on the Town Comprehensive Plan regarding specific land uses and zoning districts for individual parcels. The area to be rezoned is shown to be designated as croplands in the Town's future land use map. CPZ staff rely on the Towns to make these recommendations given the Town Board members and residents know their Town and the true purpose and intent of the plan. The Town of Reed does not participate in a farmland preservation zoning. The area in question was not designated as a farmland preservation area. As indicated by the town's resolution recommendation, it appears the rezone is consistent with the purpose and intent of the comprehensive plan. Number two, the location of the proposed development minimizes the amount of agricultural land converted and will not substantially impair or limit current or future agricultural use of other protected farmland. The parcel will not be farmed that is proposed to be of residential use. The applicant has demonstrated that there is a need for the proposed development Adequate public facilities are present or will be provided. Note impacts on roads, water, sewage, drainage, schools, emergency services, etc. And providing public facilities will not be an unreasonable burden to the local government. The need is to create a residential lot for a future single family home. All necessary public facilities are anticipated to be provided if not already provided, given any proposed development would rely on private systems such as a private well and sanitary system. No anticipated burden on local government, all applicable building, construction, and new standards will be applied during the zoning and building permit review process. 
Number four, the rezoning will not cause unreasonable air and water pollution, soil erosion, or adverse effects on rare or irreplaceable natural areas. All federal, state, and local permits and approvals are required for any applicable development on site. Additionally, the proposed rezone will likely not result in any unreasonable air, water, pollution, as all pertinent regulation apply and will need to be adhered to. Any disturbance greater than one acre would need a DNR stormwater management permit. The town has approved the proposed rezone of the property. The town of Reed Town Board has recommended approval of this rezone petition. All concerns from other agencies on the proposed rezone have been addressed. DNR, Highway, DOT, what are those concerns? The county is not made aware of any concerns from other agencies. The rezone meets all the zoning district standards as it relates to size, frontage, access, and dimension. The rezone also appears to be consistent with the purpose and intent of the town's comprehensive plan and as indicated by the town resolution. Based on the information provided above, findings of fact, conclusions of law, and the town's recommendation, it appears the rezone request meets all the rezone criteria and standards for rezoning. Therefore, CPZ staff recommend that the Environmental Resources Committee recommend approval to the Marathon County Board of Supervisors. Should the Marathon County Board of Supervisors approve this rezone, CPZ staff recommend that the town update its comprehensive plan to reflect, reflect the zoning change if applicable. Okay. Any questions for Garrett? Being hearing none, thank you. Um, moving on to public testimony, uh, I'll call those first in favor, second opposed, and third as interested. Uh, before we get too far, I do have a John uh, Sushamsky uh, on the public comment form here. Um, as I mentioned earlier, public testimony isn't a requirement uh, during the process, but if the committee has questions, that way uh, the committee can at least ask them of the applicant. So. I guess I'd start with John. Do you wish to offer testimony today? No? No. no. Okay. Uh, so anybody else uh, wishing to speak in favor of the proposed rezone, uh, please identify yourself at this time. I'll call one more time after this. Anybody wishing to speak as interest, or anybody wishing to speak in favor, so you can hear none, I'll call once. Anybody wishing to speak opposed to the rezone, uh, please identify yourself at this time. We're on 5A1, so you can hear none. Anybody wishing to speak as interested in the proposed rezone 5A1, please identify yourself at this time. Last call. Anybody wishing to speak as interested? Uh, no one else wishes to testify for this application. I am now declaring uh, the public hearing on 5A1, John Suchomsky, Heavy Industrial to Rural Residential Town of Reed, now closed. The committee will de now deliberate on the application and apply the standards of the zoning ordinance. Um, I believe a motion to approve would be in order. Um, Supervisor Seafelt? I'll make a motion for the request of the petition of John Shemonsky to amend the General Florida Ordinance of American County Chapter 17 Zoning Code to rezone lands from HI Heavy Industrial to RR Residential in the town of Reed and to approve the conclusions of law and forward it to the county board. Motion is made. Is there a second? Second by Supervisor Ritter. Any further discussion? Seeing and hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. Uh, moving on to 5A2, Nathan Cost, General Agriculture to Rural Residential and General Agriculture to Rural State, Town of Knowlton. This is a petition of Nathan Cost, petition to rezone land, staff report April 4th, 2023, for the Environmental Resources Committee. The petitioner is Tim Vreeland, residing at 6103 Dawn Street, Western Wisconsin, 54476. The property owner is Nathan Koss, residing at 2418 Morningside Drive, Rothschild, Wisconsin, 54474. Area proposed to be rezoned is located at the end of Benny Lane. The petition of Tim Freeland on behalf of Nathan Koss to amend the General Code of Ordinance for Marathon County Chapter 17 Zoning Code to rezone lands from general agriculture to rural residential and from general agriculture to rural estate as described as lot two of certified survey map number 61852313 located in the northeast quarter of the fractional southwest quarter of section three township 26 north range seven east and town of Knowlton. the area to be rezoned is described as lot one and two of the preliminary csm Parent parcel number 048-2607-033-0990. The Town of Knowlton Town Board met on March 13th, 2023. Marathon County Environmental Resources Committee is meeting today, April 4th, 2023 at 3 p.m. 
A legal advertisement was published in the Wasa Daily Herald. Notice of the zoning change request was also sent by regular mail to adjacent property owners within 300 feet of the subject property. The existing zoning district is general agriculture. The existing land use map for the town of Knowlton from their 2005 comprehensive plan shows the area to be rezoned as woodlands and single family residential in the town's existing land use map. Adjacent land uses are comprised of specialty crops, woodlands, croplands, other agriculture, and single family residential. The proposed zoning district, lot one, is proposed to go to rural residential, and lot two is proposed to go to rural estate. The future land use map for the town of Knowlton, the area proposed to be rezoned, is shown as single family residential in the town's comprehensive plan in their future land use map from 2005. The adjacent land uses are comprised of wetlands, farmland, and single family residential. The town of Knowlton does not participate in farmland preservation zoning. This is the aerial showing the property to be rezoned. Certified survey map. <clears throat> On March 13, 2023, the town of Knowlton Town Board recommended approval to Marathon County's Environmental Resources Committee. The Marathon County Comprehensive Plan relies on the Town Comprehensive Plan regarding specific land uses and zoning districts for individual parcels. The area proposed to be rezoned is shown to be designated as wetlands, farmland, and single-family residential in the Town's future land use map. CPV, CPZ staff rely on the Towns to make these recommendations given to Town Board members and residents know their Town and the true purpose and intent of the plan. The Town of Knowlton does not participate in farmland preservation zoning. The area in question was not designated as a farmland preservation area. As indicated by the town's resolution recommendation, it appears the rezone is consistent with the purpose and intent of the comprehensive plan. No farmland will be consumed. The need is for a proposed land division. All necessary public facilities are anticipated to be provided if not already provided. Given any proposed development would rely on private systems such as a private well and sanitary system if applicable. No anticipated burden on local government. All applicable building, construction, and new standards will be applied during the zoning and building permit review process. All federal, state, and local permits and approvals are required for any applicable development on site. Additionally, the proposed rezone will likely not result in any unreasonable air and water pollution as all pertinent regulations apply and will need to be adhered to. Any disturbance greater than one acre would need a DNR stormwater management permit. The Town of Knowlton Town Board has recommended approval of this rezone petition. The county was not made aware of any concerns from other agencies. The rezone meets all the zoning district standards as it relates to size, frontage, access, and dimension. The rezone also appears to be consistent with the purpose and intent of the town's comprehensive plan and as indicated by the town's resolution. Based on the information provided above, findings of fact, conclusions of law, and the town's recommendation, it appears the rezone request meets all the rezone criteria and standards for rezoning. Therefore, CPZ staff recommend that the Environmental Resources Committee recommend approval to the Marathon County Board of Supervisors. Should the rezone be approved by the Marathon County Board of Supervisors, the town should update its comprehensive plan to reflect the zoning change if applicable. Thank you, Garrett. Any questions? All right, uh, we'll move into public testimony. Uh, anybody wishing to speak in favor of the proposed rezone 5A2, Nathan Cost, General Ag to, to Rural Residential and General Agriculture to Rural State Town of Knowlton, please identify yourself at this time. Uh, anybody wishing to speak in favor of item 5A2, last call, please identify yourself at this time. Seeing and hearing none, I'll call once. Anybody wishing to speak uh, opposed to 5A2, please identify yourself at this time. Seeing hearing none, final or uh, one call for the uh, uh, those as interested for item 5A2, please identify yourself at this time. Uh, if no one else wishes to testify for this application, I'm now declaring the public hearing on 5A2, Nathan Cost, GA General Agriculture to Rural, RR Res, Rural Residential, and GA General Agriculture to RE Rural State Town Knowlton uh, now closed. The committee will now deliberate on the application, apply the standards of the zoning ordinance. That is a pleasure of the committee. Supervisor Ritter. I can make a motion to approve the petition of Tim Vreeland on behalf of Nathan Cost to amend the General Code of Ordinance for Marathon County Chapter 17 Zoning Code to rezone lands from GA General Agriculture to RR Rural Residential and also from GA General Agriculture to RE Rural Estate and the town of uh, 
Knowlton, uh, duty staff, and uh, town's recommendations. You could make a motion. Are you making the motion? I am making a motion. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> motion is made. Is there a second? Second by Supervisor Shafinsky. Any further discussion? Seeing and hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. Moving right along, 5A3, David Willman, on behalf of Travis and Troy Willman, trustees of Willman Family Legacy Trust, Light Industrial to General Agriculture, Town of Spencer. All right, this is a petition of Travis and Troy Willman, trustees of the Willman Family Legacy Trust. The petition to rezone land, staff report April 4th, 2023, Environmental Resources Committee. Petitioner is David Willman, residing at 109055 County Road C, Spencer, Wisconsin, 54479. Property owners are Travis and Troy Willman, trustees of the Willman Family Legacy Trust, residing at 401 Columbus Drive, Marshfield, Wisconsin, 54449. Area proposed to be rezoned is just west of the intersection of Abe Lincoln Ave and County Road C. The petition of David Wilman on behalf of Travis and Troy Wilman, trustees of the Wilman Family Legacy Trust, to amend the general code of ordinances for Marathon County Chapter 17 Zoning Code to rezone lands from light industrial to general agriculture as described as part of Lot 1 Certified Survey Map number 17748, recorded as document number 1738119, located in the northeast quarter of the northeast quarter and the south northwest quarter of the northeast quarter of section 12, township 26 north, range 2 east, town of Spencer. Parcel pin 074-2602-121-0990. The town of Spencer town board met on February 14th, 2023. Marathon County Environmental Resources Committee is meeting today, April 4th, 2023 at 3 p.m. A legal advertisement was published in the Wasa Daily Herald. Notice of the zoning change request was also sent by regular mail to adjacent property owners within 300 feet of the subject property. The existing zoning district is light industrial, industrial research and office district. The existing land use map for the town of Spencer from their 2017 comprehensive plan shows the area proposed to be rezoned as commercial. Adjacent land uses are comprised of agriculture and residential. The proposed zoning district is general agriculture. The future land use map for the town of Spencer's 2017 plan shows the area as commercial and the town's comprehensive future land use map. Adjacent land uses are comprised of agriculture and commercial. The town of Spencer does not participate in farmland preservation. The left photo shows the aerial of the entire property. The right photo shows the parcel being split zone between general agriculture and light industrial. This is the certified survey map showing the creation of Lot 1. <clears throat> On February 14th, 2023, the Town of Spencer Town Board recommended approval to Marathon County's Environmental Resources Committee. Number one, the Marathon County Comprehensive Plan relies on the town's comprehensive plan regarding specific land uses and zoning districts for individual parcels. The area proposed to be rezoned is shown to be designated as commercial in the town's future land use map. CPZ staff rely on the towns to make these recommendations given the town board members and residents know their town and the true purpose and intent of the plan. The town of Spencer does not participate in farmland preservation zoning. The area in question was not designated as a farmland preservation area. As indicated by the town's resolution recommendation, it appears the rezone is consistent with the purpose and intent of the comprehensive plan. Number two, no farmland will be consumed. Number three, the need is to clean up a split zone parcel as a parcel is no longer used for a commercial business. All necessary public facilities are anticipated to be provided if not already provided, given any proposed development would rely on private systems such as a private well and sanitary system if applicable. No anticipated burden on local government, all applicable building, construction, and new standards will be applied for during the zoning and building permit review process. Number four, all federal, state, and local permits and approvals are required for any applicable development on site. Additionally, the proposed rezone will likely not result in any unreasonable air and water pollution as all pertinent regulations apply and will need to be adhered to. Any disturbance greater than one acre will need a DNR stormwater management permit. Number five, the Town of Spencer Town Board has recommended approval of this rezone petition. Number six, the county has not been made aware of any concerns from other agencies. The rezone meets all the zoning district standards as it relates to size, frontage, access, and dimension. The rezone also appears to be consistent with the purpose and intent of the town's comprehensive plan and as indicated by the town resolution. 
Based on the information provided above, findings of fact, conclusions of law, and the town's recommendation, it appears the rezone request meets all the rezone criteria and standards for rezoning. Therefore, CPZ staff recommend that the Environmental Resources Committee recommend approval to the Marathon County Board of Supervisors. Should the Marathon County Board of Supervisors approve the rezone, CPZ staff recommend that the town update its comprehensive plan to reflect the zoning change if applicable. All right, thank you, Garrett. Any questions for staff? Seeing and hearing none, move on. Uh, public testimony. Uh, I do have a Dave Will, uh, Willman, uh, I, I believe is here. Yes. Dave, do you wish to offer testimony? Yes. Okay. Uh, so come forward to the mic. Uh, state your name, and I'll sorry you in. So state your name, please. Dave Willman. Uh, uh, then raise your right hand, please. Uh, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? I do. Okay. Um, so uh, any testimony you wish to offer, you can. Well, write. basically, I just make myself available if yep. anybody would have any questions. Yep. Uh, and that's fine. So the other half is, yeah, if anybody would have any questions, they could ask them of you. So does anybody from the committee have questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anybody else wishing to speak in favor of 5A3, please identify yourself this time. Last call. Uh, anybody, wishing, uh, anybody else wishing to speak in favor? Okay, seeing and hearing none. Anybody wishing to speak opposed to 5A3, please identify yourself at this time. Last call. Anybody wishing to speak opposed? Seeing and hearing none. Uh, one call, uh, final call for anybody wishing to speak as interested for 5A3, please identify yourself this time. Okay, uh, seeing as that no one else wishes to testify for this application, I'm now declaring the public hearing on 5A3, David Willman, on behalf of Travis and Troy Willman, trustees of Willman Family Legacy Trust, Light Industrial to General Agriculture, Town of Spencer, now closed. Uh, the committee will now deliberate on the application, apply the standards of zoning ordinance. It was a pleasure to the committee. So, Mr. Seafelt? I'll make a motion for the petition of David Williams on behalf of the microphone, please. So, Mr. Seafelt. Then use the last time. Oh. I Sorry guess I'm about not that. paying attention. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, I'll make a motion for the petition of David William on behalf of Travis and Troy William, trustee of William Family Legacy Trust, to amend the general code of ordinance, ordinances for Marathon County, Chapter 17, Zoning Code, to rezone land from LI Light Industrial to GA General Agriculture in the town of Spencer and to move forward the conclusion of law and to move it to the county board. For David Willman. David William. Well, David William, yep. Willman. 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 Okay. okay. Motion is made. Is there a second? Second by Supervisor Drabeck. Any further discussion? Seeing and hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. All right, 5A4, Larry J. Schuer, trustee on behalf of Schuer Revocable Living Trust, General Agriculture Department of Preservation, Town of McMillan. We're over halfway done. Back to Garrett. This is a petition for Shower Revocable Living Trust, petition to rezone land. Staff report April 4th, 2023, Environmental Resources Committee. The petitioner is Larry J. Shower, residing at 200955 Galvin Avenue. Marshfield, Wisconsin, 54449. Shower Revocable Living Trust, residing at the same residence. The area proposed to be rezoned is located just south of the intersection of County Road C and Galvin Avenue. The petition of Larry J. Shower, trustee on behalf of Shower Revocable Living Trust to amend the general code of ordinances for Marathon County Chapter 17 zoning code to rezone lands from general agriculture to farmland preservation. Described as lot two of certified survey map number 19203, recorded as document number 1857529, located in the southeast quarter of the northeast quarter and in the southwest quarter of the northeast quarter of section nine, township 26 north, range three east, town of McMillan, parcel pin number 0562603090988. The town of McMillan town board met March 13, 2023. Marathon County Environmental Resources Committee is meeting today, April 4th, 2023 at 3 p.m. A legal advertisement was published in the Wasa Daily Herald. Notice of the zoning change request was also sent by regular mail to adjacent property owners within 300 feet of the subject property. The existing zoning district is general agriculture. 
also farmland preservation. The existing land use map for the town of McMillan for the 2021 comprehensive plan shows the area proposed to be rezoned as agriculture. Adjacent land uses are comprised of woodlands, agriculture, and residential. The proposed zoning district is farmland preservation. The future land use map for the town of McMillan from their 2021 plan shows the area proposed to be rezoned as agriculture and general agriculture and the town's comprehensive future land use map. Adjacent land uses are comprised of agriculture and general agriculture. The town of McMillan participates in farmland preservation zoning. Approximately 23.39 acres of farmland preservation area will be added. This is the parcel here. The picture on the right shows the area in blue that will be go from general agriculture to farmland preservation. The certified survey map. On March 13, 2023, the Town of McMillan Town Board recommended approval to Marathon County's Environmental Resources Committee. Number one, the Marathon County Comprehensive Plan relies on the Town Comprehensive Plan regarding specific land uses and zoning districts for individual parcels. The area proposed to be rezoned is shown to be designated as agriculture and general agriculture in the town's future land use map. CPZ staff rely on the towns to make these recommendations given the town board members and residents know their town and the true purpose and intent of the plan. The town of McMillan participates in farmland preservation. The area in question was not designated as a farmland preservation area. As indicated by the resolution recommendation, it appears the rezone is consistent with the purpose and intent of the comprehensive plan. Number two, the land will continue to be farmed. Number three, the need is for a proposed land combination. All necessary public facilities are anticipated to be provided if not already provided, given any proposed development would rely on private systems such as a private well and sanitary system. No anticipated burden on local government. All applicable building, construction, and new standards will be applied during the zoning and building permit review process. All federal, state, and local permits and approvals are required for any applicable development on site. Additionally, the area proposed to be rezoned will likely not result in any unreasonable air and water pollution as all pertinent regulations apply and will need to be adhered to. Any disturbance greater than one acre would need a DNR stormwater management permit. The Town of McMillan Town Board has recommended approval of this rezone petition. The county was also not made aware of any concerns from other agencies. The rezone meets all the zoning district standards as it relates to size, frontage, access, and dimension. The rezone also appears to be consistent with the purpose and intent of the town's comprehensive plan and as indicated by the town resolution. Based on the information provided above, findings of fact, conclusions of law, and the town's recommendation, it appears that rezone request meets all the rezone criteria and standards for rezoning. Therefore, CPZ staff recommend that the Environmental Resources Committee recommend approval to the Marathon County Board of Supervisors. Should the Marathon County Board of Supervisors approve the rezone, CPZ staff recommend that the town update their comprehensive plan to reflect the zoning change, if applicable. Thank you, Garrett. Any questions for staff? All right. We on a public testimony. Anybody wishing to speak in favor of 5A4, please identify yourself at this time. One more call. Anybody wishing to speak in favor of 5A4, identify yourself at this time. Seeing and hearing none. Uh, one call, anybody wishing to speak uh, against 5A4, please identify yourself at this time. Seeing and hearing none. One call for anybody wishing to speak as interested for 5A4, please identify yourself at this time. Uh, if no one else wishes to testify for this application, I'm now declaring the public hearing on 5A4, Larry G. Larry J. Shower, sure. Trustee on behalf of Shore Revocable Living Trust, General Agriculture to Farmland Preservation Town of McMillan is closed. The committee will now deliberate on the application, apply the standards of the zoning ordinance. Motion to approve would be in order, I believe. Supervisor Drabeck. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to make a motion to approve the rezone of Larry Shore on behalf of the Shore Revo Revocable Living Trust from General Agriculture to Farmland Preservation based on the staff report findings and findings of fact and conclusions of law and also the town's approval. Uh, motion was made. Is there a second? Uh, second by uh, uh, Ronnie Roscoff. Any further discussion? Seeing and hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. Uh, I have to turn over the chairmanship to uh, Vice Chair Drabeck just for a moment. So uh, if you'd want to proceed with 5A5, I'll hand this over. And then there's. 
I'll be right back. All right, thank you much. Um, continuing on at 5A5, uh, the rezone for Jason, and I, I'm gonna mess that name up, Filger, on behalf of uh, Merle and Esther Martin, farmland preservation to uh, neighborhood commercial, town of Hull. Um, this is a petition for Merle and Esther Martin, petition to rezone land, staff report April 4th, 2023, the Environmental Resources Committee. The petitioner is Jason Flieger, residing at 163957 Owl Ridge Road, Wausau, Wisconsin, 54403. The property owners are Merle and Esther Martin, residing at 107167 Huckleberry Road, Colby, Wisconsin, 54421. The area proposed to be rezoned is located just west of the intersection of Huckleberry Road and County Road F. The petition of Jason Flieger on behalf of Merle and Esther Martin to amend the General Code of Ordinances for Marathon County Chapter 17 Zoning Code to rezone lands from farmland preservation to neighborhood commercial located in part of the southwest quarter of the southeast quarter of Section 11, Township 28 North, Range 2 East, Town of Hall. Parcel to be rezoned is described as Lot 1 of the preliminary CSM. The parent parcel pin is 044-2802-114-0997. The Town of Hull Town Board met on March 30th, 2023. Marathon County Environmental Resources Committee is meeting today, April 4th, 2023 at 3 p.m. A legal advertisement was published in the Wasa Daily Herald. Notice of the zoning change request was also sent by regular mail to adjacent property owners within 300 feet of the subject property. The existing zoning district is farmland preservation. The existing land use map for the Town of Hull from their 2005 comprehensive plan shows the area to be rezoned as croplands, woodlands, and other agriculture in the town's comprehensive existing land use map. Adjacent land uses are comprised of croplands, woodlands, other agriculture, and single family residential. The proposed zoning district is neighborhood commercial. The future land use map for the town of Hull from their 2005 plan shows the area to be rezoned as croplands, woodlands, and other agriculture. The adjacent land uses are comprised of croplands, agriculture, woodlands, and single family residential. The Town of Hall participates in farmland preservation. Approximately 2.069 acres of farmland preservation area will be lost. This is the aerial showing the property. And this is the certified survey map. Lot 1 is the area that is proposed to be rezoned. On March 30th, 2023, the Town of Hall Town Board recommended approval to Marathon County's Environmental Resources Committee. Number one, the Marathon County Comprehensive Plan relies on the Town Comprehensive Plan regarding specific land uses and zoning districts for individual parcels. The area proposed to be rezoned is shown to be designated as croplands, woodlands, and other agriculture in the town's future land use map. CPZ staff rely on the towns to make these recommendations given the town board members and residents know their town and the true purpose and intent of the plan. The Town of Hall does participate in farmland preservation zoning. The area in question was designated as a farmland preservation area. As indicated by the town's resolution recommendation, it appears the rezone is consistent with the purpose and intent of the comprehensive plan. Number two, approximately 2.069 acres of farmland will be lost. Number three, the need is to create a parcel that permits the location of a parochial school. All necessary public facilities are anticipated to be provided if not already provided, given any proposed development would rely on private systems such as a private well and sanitary system. No anticipated burden on local government, all applicable building, construction, and use standards will be applied during the zoning and building permit review process. Number four, all federal, state, and local permits and approvals are required for any applicable development on site. Additionally, the proposed rezone will likely not result in any unreasonable air and water pollution, as all pertinent regulations apply and will need to be adhered to. Any disturbance greater than one acre would need a DNR stormwater management permit. Number five, the Town of Hall Town Board has recommended approval of this rezone petition. Number six, the county was not made aware of any concerns from other agencies. The rezone meets all the zoning district standards as it relates to size, frontage, access, and dimension. The rezone also appears to be consistent with the purpose and intent of the town's comprehensive plan and as indicated by the town resolution. Based on the information provided above, findings of fact, the conclusions of law, and the town's recommendation, it appears the rezone request meets all the rezone criteria and standards for rezoning. Therefore, CPZ staff recommend that the Environmental Resources Committee recommend approval to the Marathon County Board of Supervisors. Should the Marathon County Board of Supervisors approve this rezone, CPZ staff recommend that the town update its comprehensive plan to reflect the zoning change if applicable. 
Thank you. Um, is there any questions for uh, the staff? Any of the committee members have questions? All right. Um, continuing on then, if anybody wants to speak in favor of this uh, rezone, maybe come up now and speak. Anybody wanting to speak in favor of this? And call on one more time. Anybody want to speak in favor? Um, anybody want to speak against it? Uh, come up now. Um, call on one more time. Anybody want to speak against it? Um, anybody as interested? Okay, if that's the case, I call this uh, closed, I guess. And... Uh, the committee will go to deliberating. Thank you. Any any deliberation? Any questions? I'll make a motion to approve the petition of uh, Jason Flager on behalf of Merle and Esther Martin to amend the general code of ordinances for Marathon County Chapter 17 zoning code to rezone lands from farmland preservation to neighborhood commercial. Uh, located in the town of Hall due to uh, uh, staff and town recommendations. Okay, Supervisor Schwinski, second. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. I believe that concludes all of them, the uh, rezones. There are uh, town of Stitt yes, results uh, as well. Yeah. Cool. Here comes Jake. Okay, he did continue it on. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> Just in time, he got back. No, you can finish it out if you want to. Yeah. <laughs> we are told. Uh, where, where are we exactly? Uh, we're we're, at, we're done with the five A five. Five A five. Yes. Okay. Uh, so I think we're on the five B now, right? Or we just fit. Yeah. yeah. Uh, for the town zoning changes for 5B, review and possible recommendations, county board for, for its consideration. Town zoning changes pursuant to Wisconsin statute 60.62 sub 3. Um, Garrett, if you wouldn't mind, just go through and talk a little bit about 1 through 4. Just indicate where you're switching from 1 to 2, 2 to 3 in that. Okay. But for the sake of time, I'd be willing to entertain approval for all of those in a motion, just one motion. So go ahead. So town zone towns like Town of Satine have to come through the Environmental Resources Committee uh, in order to pass rezones as a formality and then through the county board as well. So uh, 5B1, the Town of Satine, A3 to RR for 141726 Woodland Drive. 5B2, Town of Satine, A3 to A1, address 235100 North 136th Avenue. 5B3, Town of Satine, CP to M2, address 917 South 60th Avenue. 5B4, Town of Satine, RR to RS 140, uh, address 145373 Satine Drive. If I could just add something there, I think I may need to be sworn in now. No, you don't. Oh, perfect. Yeah, um, so I did just want to add that. Uh, like for the last the last meeting we did have a town rezone that there wasn't something supplied to the county all of these rezones uh, have supplied the required information including the the information that it was posted properly okay any questions for staff <coughs> if not like i said i'll entertain the motion to take all those items as one that way we don't have to make four separate motions mm -hmm. Supervisor Shepinski? i would like to make a motion that uh pursuant to uh Wisconsin Statute 60.62 sub 3 that uh, we approve the town of Statine rezones as documented and recorded by staff. 5B1 through 4? Yes, sir. Okay. Motion is made. Is there a second? Second by uh, 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 Rodney Roscoff. Uh, any further discussion? Seeing and hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. All right. Uh, C, review and possible recommendations to the county board for its consideration. None. D, review and possible action. Uh, one, rural view estates, first edition, final plot, Mountain, 
REI Civil Environment and Environmental Engineering Survey. So that's the one I'm reading on here. Oh. <laughs> Which is the one that was posted? This was posted yesterday. This, this yeah. was, okay. All right, thank you. So I'm reading the wrong one. Uh, C, review and possible recommendations to Conable for its consideration. One, Marathon Park Water Project. Uh, okay. Uh, Jamie, whenever you're ready, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Um, I'll keep this very brief. Um, just wanted to give the uh, committee an update on the water project uh, because I had brought this to you in a closed session with the idea that possibly our estimates were over what the allocated budget was. But I'm happy to say that we had bid openings last week, Tuesday, and um, we are able to move forward with the project within the allocated amount. Um, that was allocated in the ARPA dollars to get the water main laterals and the looping completed. Uh, so we're just working on finalizing those documents and um, getting our permits in place so that we can start this. Um, it will be on the schedule that we had originally planned starting as soon as we can start. Um, and then with the completion date of July 18th so that it is complete, restored and water on for the fair. Uh, so we are moving forward with it. Okay. Um, so no additional funding needed at this time, right? Correct. Yes. Very good. Any questions from the committee? One question, and that was, uh, what did the bids come in at? Well, we're, we're uh, still working on that, but our because we bought, uh, we're getting the equipment all ourselves. Our equipment cost for all the piping and everything um, is about 200000 And then the low bidder uh, right now with the alternate of looping it through the park and putting in a, a lateral to our splash pad, um, we are at... Five hundred and I just had it in front of me. Five hundred fifty-six thousand six hundred sixty-four dollars. So, with the two hundred thousand of materials, uh, that's at seven fifty-six. And then we do still have construction administration on that. That's the piece we are uh, finalizing at the moment of who will do that. The city of Wausau may help us do that, um, or we will have to have one of the contractors do it. But our budgeted amount was nine fifty nine hundred fifty thousand. Uh, so we are underneath that um, and do have some contingency to work with going forward. Very good. <laughs> Any other questions? All right. Uh, thank you, Jamie. Thank you. Uh, uh, Chair Long and Han, I was working off the wrong printout. You, you have the right agenda. Oh, okay. It is on, this is on the agenda, so that's fine. <laughs> okay. So just to clarify, <laughs> then we just did 6A2, so yes, that one's yes. done. Okay. That's fine. Um, old printout. What's that? <coughs> the old printout. Okay. Uh, so we'll jump back to 5D, which is review and possible action one. Rural View Estates, first uh, edition, final plat, Mountain REI Civil and Environmental Engineering Survey, and I think that's Dave. Yes, um, so the staff report was included along with um, the plat itself and then an approval letter from the DNR. Um, so I'll just go through the, the staff report, Royal View Estates, first edition, Town of Rib Mountain. Uh, this is the final plat staff report, uh, the plat does comply with Chapter 23634 of the Wisconsin Statutes, Chapter 87 of the Wisconsin Administrative Code, and Chapter 18 of the Marathon County Code of Ordinances, ordinances regarding subdivisions and mapping. Uh, the plat is in Rib Mountain and is town zoned, and it was rezoned prior to the preliminary plat to meet the zoning requirements for the town. Uh, environmental conditions, the stormwater management plan was submitted with the preliminary plat. The erosion control plan was included with that stormwater management plan and wetland areas have been identified on the plat. The plat will be provided, uh, sanitary sewer will be provided by the Rib Mountain Sanitary District and has been approved by the DNR per approval letter that was included in your packet. 
All proposed lots will have access to an improved public road and the Marathon County Highway Department is aware of the design and supports the layout for access. Uh, prior to the submittal of the Royal View, first, uh, Royal View Estates first edition preliminary plat for approval, a concept plat meeting was held on October 8th in 2021 to discuss the plat. Present at that meeting were representatives from Rib Mountain, REI Engineering, Marathon County, and BPW Development LLC. Design concepts and plans were discussed and agreed upon by all parties involved. The preliminary plat reflected the design discussed in this meeting and was approved by the Environmental Resources Committee on August 2nd of last year. This final plat substantially conforms to the preliminary plat. Recommendation based on the information provided, CPZ staff recommend that the Environmental Resources Committee approve the proposed final plat of Royal View Estates first edition. I uh, also note that Tom Redens from REI Engineering is here. If anyone would have any questions regarding the plat, he may help answer as well. Okay. Uh, any questions from the committee? Uh, and I usually ask this question then. Uh, so this is to be approved. Where does this go then? Just here. Just here. Okay. Is that for all plats, by the way? Or there's. Oh, okay. All right. Um, any questions? Yeah, go ahead, Sergeant Rubin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm just curious. I know it says all lot two. I'm just want to know what that was exactly. So all lot two is being dedicated to the town of Rib Mountain for stormwater management purposes. So that's where the stormwater management pond will be hmm. constructed. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing and hearing none, I believe a motion to approve would be in order. I'll make a motion to approve the. Uh, no, I lost it. The Royal Views uh, Estate um, Plat. Yep. Motion is made. Is there a second? Second by Supervisor Ritter. Any further discussion? Seeing and hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. Um, so now we are on to D2, updates to zoning and land division fee schedules. Okay, so I just wanted to start up by saying any of the um, edits that we've made, the, all the propositions we're making for the fee schedules, either something that we are currently regulating that we're providing more clarity on, or it's a new service that we're going to be providing. So up on the screen, if I can get it to roll, you can see where this is our current fee schedule. Everything can you in zoom blue. in, Garrett? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, everything in blue are the a little proposed more changes. What was that? Zoom in a little bit more. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. So, like I said, everything in blue are the proposed changes or an edit. Like in the accessory structures, we also regulate additions based on that as well um, to those accessory structures. <coughs> um, and then anything in red throughout the fee schedule is something that we're going to be eliminating from the fee schedule. Like accessory structures here, that's part of, tarp structures are part of the accessory structures as well. Right? So we can go through these, uh, our proposed update here. Uh, the first one is private roof mounted solar arrays. Uh, currently we regulate them as accessory structures. Um, a lot of times those accessory structures, um, they go up in size, so anywhere from zero to 100 feet is usually exempt from a fee. 101 to 800 square feet is $125, and then from 800 square feet and larger is 250. Um, so our justification here, chapter 17 regulates roof mounted solar arrays and we don't have a specific fee established to review those permits. Right now, they, like I said, they're lumped under the accessory size. Uh, roof mounted solar arrays um, are placed on top of the roof of the existing structure. What we review them for is for the height to see that they don't exceed the peak of that structure or that they don't protrude more than 12 inches above the peak of the roof. Uh, the next one we have is a private ground mounted solar arrays. Uh, we, we have been um, putting those under accessory structures as well. 
Um, we're proposing to keep doing that, but we're pulling that out and having a specific fee listed on our fee schedule for those. Uh, the tarp accessory structure, less than 350 square feet. Um, the current fee for that is $25. We're proposing to eliminate that. Um, we regulate accessory structures, whether they're tarp structures, uh, hard-sided structure, um, as an accessory structure, and we do all our fees based on those accessory sizes. Uh, residential fences. Um, we've based those on accessory sizes as well. Instead of square feet, we use linear feet. Um, so we're proposing to make that fee $75. Um, we previ previously based the fee for fences on the accessory structures, like I said. Um, if a fence was over 100 linear feet, the permit fee um, would go from being exempt to $125. Um, and we believe right now the current per, uh, permit fee does not reflect the scope of the project as it relates to the requir requirements in Chapter 17. Did you have a question, Jacob? Uh, I, no, no, no. But now it's just a flat 75. So, Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of basing it on that accessory structure size. Yep. Yep. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Our next uh, proposal is for small wind energy systems for 300 kilowatts or less. Um, we're proposing that they, um, they're currently $100 fee. We're proposing a fee of $100 uh, per turbine. We have reached out to other counties as far as what they charge for small wind energy systems. And it's, it's a highly variable scale. Um, Grant County, for example, charges about $1,500 per wind turbine on top of what uh, conditional use permit. Um, the majority of counties that we got uh, answers from uh, also do everything through conditional use permit. Right now in our ordinance, the small wind energy systems, the ones that are 300 kilowatts or less, are permitted uh, use in all districts. Um, unless they're in farmland preservation, then they become a conditional use. Another fee uh, that we are proposing, uh, the mitigation plan and affidavit. Um, this also includes a register of, D record, re register of D's recording fee. Right now it's uh, currently at $75. We're proposing to raise that to $175. Um, speaking with other counties, it's generally not something that they, that they do, a service that they offer. They, a lot of times, would have to have an engineering company or some sort of a water specialist design the mitigation plan for revegetation and stormwater management. Um, and this, not only is that for commercial sites, but it's also for um, what we're talking about here is for the residential purposes in the shoreland areas. Um, so the original fee did not ac accurately reflect, reflect the staff time put into a mitigation plan. The minimum amount of time to design a mitigation plan is about two hours. Um, and the recording fee is $30 for the mitigation affidavit, which would again be included in that $175 um, dollar permit fee. Uh, the next uh, fee addition is going to be nav navigability determinations. Currently, it's not something that we charge for. Uh, we're proposing that the fee be $250. And again, this is not a service that's generally um, performed by other counties. Um, the reason that we're beginning to perform them, we feel that there needs to be a fee for it, is that we've been um, instructed by DNR that for the purposes of shoreland zoning and navigability, we are to do these navigability determinations, the DNR. Um, they can, but they're recommending that the counties do it for the purpose of administering their own ordinances. Um, and currently, right now, the DNR charges um, $300 for a site visit. It, I guess a follow-up then, you mentioned for the purposes of enforcement, so in order to properly enforce, this would have to be done, you feel? Correct. So navigability... So prior to the, if we were to adopt this, the prior change or the the prior practice would have been you go to the DNR, the DNR charges you three hundred dollars versus this change which would result correct. We okay. we've done a couple of these. Um, we haven't charged a fee. Um, it takes two staff members um, about two hours of field work. And it's not just at that specific site. We have to go to sites upstream and downstream. Sometimes it's um, more than two sites. So initially you're inspecting three different areas to determine navigability. Okay. Um, and then it also requires another hour's worth of paperwork 
in the office and then it has to be concurred with by the DNR okay. as well. So, so it is a rather time intensive uh, undertaking. Sure. So, so quest, question for you, uh, based on this determination that we would be doing or your staff would be doing, mm -hmm. does that then have to be duplicated by the DNR for concurrence? Are we asking the property owner to essentially have two agencies uh, conduct the study? No, nope. so there, what happens is, is we perform the navigability determination and then we send our findings to the DNR um, for their concurrence. If they concur with what we, if they agree with what we have determined as far as if, if it's navigable or not, they will then accept that, enter that into their system, and then it shows up on what they call the surface water data viewer, and it's logged on that site. If the DNR would, would to not agree with our assessment, um, I haven't gotten to that point. They would most likely contact us, I would think, to figure out what either something that we didn't do or a different way to do it. Um, did you have a follow-up? No, thank you. Okay, I'm going to cut it. I, regardless, I was going to cut in line. So um, <laughs> the I guess my so then let's say that that navigability was challenged by the DNR, um, which you said to this point that it hasn't been by our staff. Correct. Um, would they then charge the 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 person uh, three hundred dollars in order for them to go out and do it? I, I can respond to that one. Yeah. Um, so essentially, what what it is we're doing is uh, the DNR has a form. It's called the third party navigability determination, and that's essentially the field work portion of the of the determination, um, and that's what they're using. They would go on site, get that information that's on that third party navigability determination form, which they charge $300 for the site visit. We're essentially doing the site visit for them. So their review process is of the field data that we get. Um, we, we go through the form, uh, we make our determination, we say it, we, we think it's non navigable based off the data. They look at the data that we've provided them if they're comfortable with it they essentially, it, they, they give it the okay. Um, if it's something where they feel there's a lack of information, um, they would then come back to us and say, um, you know, I, I, we, we need this verification or we need this data point um, to make a, a concurrence on your, on your navigability determination. So it's just additional work. They wouldn't have to pay anything beyond the $250 then if we're to be challenged by the DNR. Correct. Okay. Sorry, or go ahead, Gary. Look, oh, supervisor Rebecca, and then supervisor Old Rack. Yep, thank you, Mr. Chair. I was just wondering what uh, what makes it navigable, um, how high the water's got to be, or whatever, and what kind of you know, and what time of year because sometimes water's higher than others. So the DNR defines navigability as the ability to float a craft on a recurring basis. So it also has to have the, the area in question also has to have what's called a defined bed and bank. So it can't just be, you know, kind of a flat ditch that sometimes kind of holds water. It has to have those kind of features, that defined bed and bank. Um, when they say float craft on a, a craft on a recurring basis, um, it could be for really any amount of time that you could float that through. There's two determinations. There's navigability in opinion and navigability in fact. The navigability in opinion is what we would be doing where we're not actually um, floating that craft. The navigability, in fact, is when somebody would come out and we would actually fl uh, float that craft. Um, I would think 99% of the time, the only ones that I have done are navigability and opinion. Um, and if we were to be challenged, then we would have to most likely do the navigability in fact. Thank you. I was just wondering with the, uh, the service, it says that most counties aren't offering this. Is this something that we're going beyond what we need to do as far as services and charging when other agencies, the state is handling, such as the DNR? I'm just wondering yeah. if a person's on a shore, you know, in the shoreline protection area, they're usually on a higher priced piece of property also that we're taxing more. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering how how we're charging user fees or basically fees for something that, you know, we're just raising those fees. Is it something that we should be providing or mm -hmm. is it better to be provided by the agency that, such as the DNR? 
so all waterways that that show up on our map are considered considered navigable right off the bat if somebody says no it's you know it's a foot wide and it never has any water in it we that's the purpose of the navigability determination we can determine whether or not we need to um, apply shoreland ordinance uh, chapter 22 standards to it um, or just our chapter 17 standards as well. That can mean the, the difference between whether or not they're having to obtain a shoreland alteration permit, which is a $400 permit, or just a general permit, especially if they're doing something like putting a, sh a shed that, you know, the permit fee is $125 normally, um, you know, 100 feet from the stream, that's within that shoreland alteration area. So it, it has that benefit to determine whether, um, how, what ordinances we need to um, apply. And we've been instructed um, by the DNR that we're, we're, they're recommending that we perform those navigability determinations um, in light of them for the purposes of administering our ordinance. I'll just add, yeah, what the DNR is pushing on us to take over this duty, I would say, is kind of the, the message we're getting. <laughs> so, because they think it makes more sense because it is our ordinance. So, so even though other counties aren't charging yet, we think they will probably, if they decide that they can take it over, they'll probably start charging as well. So. Uh, speaking as, as one of those property owners, although I was not subject to uh, Marathon County because we're in the city of Schofield, um, I think that, that is, uh, it's advisable for us to do this as a county. And the reason I say that is it, it provides a service to somebody who may be in a position uh, where there's questions, are they within uh, shoreland zoning or not? Uh, you know, what applies, what does not apply? Is it navigable, is it not navigable? You know, all those questions. And being able to come to Marathon County as a resource to, to get those answers rather than having to play, uh, you know, call every agency to find out who's going to actually accept the responsibility to give me an answer as a property owner. I think, I think that's a valuable service. So I, I would agree with that. Any other questions for that one? It will circle back with more discussion too, but uh, if nothing for right now. Okay. So continue on Garrett. All right. So the, the next one is accessory structures located within the floodplain, a uh, hundred square feet or less. Currently, we charge $100 for something like that. We're uh, proposing to eliminate that. Um, all structures that are located within the floodplain, no matter what their size are, um, have to be reviewed like any other permit, and then they're subject to reviews from FEMA as well as the DNR um, because of the flood stain stand, uh, floodplain standards. Um, another one we have listed is a special zoning permit uh, fee plus mitigation permit we have for $175. Um, we're proposing to eliminate that. Um, we have not issued a special zoning permit with mitigation plans that are included. Uh, a mitigation plan is a separate cost as we have uh, we discussed further up the chart um, and are subject to, to different standards as well. Uh, and one that we are also, because of the new update that we made to chapter 18, chapter 17 and chapter 15 regarding uh, sale and exchange for the land division ordinance. Um, we're proposing sale and exchange reviews for uh, county zone towns because it's now in our ordinance. Um, we're proposing a fee if you're in a, of $100 if you're in a county zone town. So that would be $50 for a zoning compliance review and then $50 for the pulse compliance review to make sure that no um, irregularities, irregularities um, or any other issues appear um, by making that land division. Um, and then for a sale and exchange review for non-county zone towns of $50, um, because they would only, they're not subject to county zoning regulations, they're only subject to chapter 15 pouts, so they would be doing that review. So those last two, are you saying that's just in the that's that's just in the realm of realm or just in the realm of land division, or is that for everything, for zoning? Well, it's it's part of Chapter 18 because we did the update to Chapter 18 because in 236, um, we're not allowed to require CSM for neighbor neighbor sale and exchange, 
Um, so when we made the update, what we're requiring is that some form of documentation outlining what the exchange is, how much of the property, where it's located, that kind of thing, is sent to the county for review to make sure that, um, to catch things like if a rezone is needed, um, to make sure that what is happening is going to meet lot standards in county zone towns, and then in all towns where Chapter 15 of Pulse Ordinance is applied, um, it makes sure that the system remains on the correct parcel and you're not splitting that system off from the, the property that it is serving. Okay. Any questions? Then we'll just move on to general discussion, but for those last couple, any questions right now? Okay. I, oh, oh there, I guess there is one more I forgot about here. Okay. Sorry. In chapter uh, for the land division, um, fee schedule, part of that sale and exchange, we're also adding um, a fee for a courtesy review to be done by Dave Decker, our county surveyor. Um, that is, a, it's a $50 charge. So that is for when, again, that sale and exchange from neighbor to neighbor. Um, if they're concerned, it's not a requirement, but if the person that's, you know, writing up the legal description or doing the plat, if they're concerned, um, that they may not be adhering to 236 in Chapter 87, um, then they can ask Dave to do that review for $50. And I'm guessing Dave may have been getting asked to do such a service and... Occasionally. Occasionally, yeah. Um, so... Okay, occasionally, um, a surveyor, many surveyors work alone in Marathon County. I, a lot of them do anyway. Um, so they, they do, um, occasionally I do get requests to do a review, a survey review portion. So, uh, you know, this would just be a, 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 a toggle on the application that they could select and they would pay that ad additional fee. And then we would know that I would just do the full review on it. Sure. I would not review it for our land division ordinance, chapter 18. It would be strictly for um, statutory, state statute requirements okay which you know fee and i i've talked about this already on the i've talked about this already in front of the committee but yeah fees are a pain um but you have to remember with a lot of the services like if dave gets asked to do something like that do you use the levy dollars to go towards that service or if it's something that's going to specifically benefit one case, a fee is a little bit more equitable because then, you know, the fee isn't impacted or the, the levy isn't impacted compared to just the, the fee here. So um, that's why I asked that question. So any other things to report for this? Okay. Yeah. So as we're back. I, I guess how, how much analysis is done on the user fees on the impact to the department as far as hours and, and fees? We mentioned, you know, how much of effect does it have on the tax levy? Do we know that? Uh, I guess I, I'd like to understand that a little bit better as far as what these fees are actually doing. Are they really where they should be? Should they not be there? Should the levy dollars be providing that service because they're increasing taxes or property tax or property values? So I, I guess. My question is how beneficial are fees or is it costing us to do fees uh, as far as administration and and just if does it really reflect the hours that are the department is putting in for these uh, items? Uh, yeah, so I can address that to a degree. It's a very complicated question, and it's one we're analyzing more in depth this year with the class wage study. So, um, so I can't I can't answer exactly for you that all to all of our fees yet. But what we did with this list of fees here, the ones we brought forward this year, are the ones that we know are not recouping our costs as they should be, especially as it relates to the mitigation plan. So we, we know for a long time that that one has not been balancing out in terms of the hours we're putting in to those efforts for landowners. Um, the other ones we targeted this year, especially were ones that uh, really that we wanted to eliminate because either they were sort of duplicative or redundant or weren't quite capturing uh, something we were actually doing or providing. And then we tried to clear up 
some some places where we were assuming this is where we should be charging it, but actually we wanted to make sure, especially as it related to solar and wind, that uh, we were having a fee listed so we know exactly where to charge it when it comes up. But to your question, I can't give you the full picture yet because we're actually doing some analysis this year to try and get a better handle on that in light of the class wage increases. So. Um, that's a more in-depth discussion that we can have in the future, though, I'm sure. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm perfectly fine with discussing that. We would just have to wait for more analysis to be done. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So it's something we are starting to track and look into. So. Okay. All right. Any other questions, comments? Concerns? Um, if these were to be approved, they would, of course, go to the full board as well, correct? No? Actually, no. The we set them it, here? We have in our ordinances, it says that it is approved at the ERC committee level. So. Okay. All right. Well, it was a pleasure of the committee. Roger Shafinsky? I'd like to make a motion that uh, we approve the changes to the uh, zoning fees as uh, presented. Motion has been made. Is there a second? Second by Supervisor Drabeck. Any further discussion? Seeing and hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. Moving on to six, educational presentations, outcome monitoring reports and committee discussion. A, department updates, conservation planning and zoning, parks, rec and forestry, solid waste. Two, MS4 annual report. And I think that's why Jeff is joining us today. That is correct. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you should have in your packet uh, the 2022 annual report that's submitted to DNR. Uh, this is something for those of you who are new to the committee, uh, we do this every year. Um, it is put together by Kevin Lang uh, in, in terms of the document or the actual report. We contribute from the perspective of the public education, public information side of things, also from the Stormwater Coalition. So we provide the necessary education to the general public. In that document, you will find uh, information that DNR seeks in terms of, for example, uh, how many ins inspections were conducted for dry weather outfalls uh, how many tons of salt did you use uh, in that given year, um, and the types of educational elements that we've provided, they have to be passive and active uh, under DNR's requirements. Uh, again, this is uh, uh, for MS4 communities. We do have an NPDES permit through DNR, and that is also, uh, is something that's established by federal statute at US EPA level. So we are a designated MS4 community. MS4 regulations have been established since March 10th, 2003. So it's we're 20 years into this across the country for those who participate. Um, and so if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer any questions you may have to this. Uh, it is due and should have been submitted on March 31st, correct? That's Friday. Thank you, sir. Um, but we are required by DNR also to provide this information and present this uh, to our committees. We will also be presenting this at the Infrastructure Committee on Thursday. Okay, any questions on the document? That was provided in the packet? No. Oh. All right. Well, this is just here for presentation today. Um, so uh, we'll move on to six, uh, six, four, overview of MS4 urban stormwater quality management plan. So I'll start and then Jeff will add in terms of what I'm missing here. But as part of our MS4 permit, we are required to have a stormwater quality management plan done so that we can identify where we are not in compliance and identify how we will then 
get into compliance as it relates to pollutant discharge in our MS4 permit area. So in 2019, we got a grant from the DNR in order to do our stormwater quality management plan update. It had not been updated since 2011. And at that, around that same time is when we also got the new standards for total maximum daily load requirements. So through this analysis, Strand and Associates and the Wisconsin DNR did look at our MS4 permit area and found that we were out of compliance for total phosphorus in one reach of our permit area by about 42.7 pounds. And for comparison's sake, I was explaining this to Lance earlier, <laughs> he said, for comparison's sake, uh, in the Fenwood, we're trying to reduce by 14,000 pounds. So we're only trying to get a reduction of 42.7 here is where we're in excess. So we're actually in pretty good shape um, for our MS4 permit and compared to our other municipal partners as well. But we are required to come up with a plan that, or a roadmap for DNR on how we're going to achieve this reduction. So that is why we worked with Strand and Associates and the Wisconsin DNR along with Kevin Lang from Highways and Jeff here from CPZ to come up with a plan for how we would do this. Strand is going to come to the county board in April to present more in depth about what is in this plan and the analysis and these recommendations, but we wanted to bring it forth to ERC and infrastructure first to see what other questions um, we should have Strand address in that presentation. For reference here, uh, so in the memo we put in the packet for reference, this is reach 154. Let me see if I can zoom in a little bit, which is showing the area where we aren't in compliance. That's Marathon Park, so it's mostly the area here right around the courthouse and Lake Wausau. And then in terms of reaching that compliance, what Strand and Associates had to do was look at a, a host of projects and options for us for how to get that reduction that we needed in 154. And as it relates to the recommendations, I think there's a, several things to note in the recommendations they've made for us that outside of water quality trading credit, Credits, other options that we pursue to achieve this reduction must be projects that are conducted within REACH 154. So we can't look to get that reduction with a project we build elsewhere. But with water quality trading credits, which are also an option for us here, there are, there are things where we can look upstream and downstream and possibly even pursue agricultural credits to get the compliance that we're going to need to come into. But as it relates to water quality trading credits, we're still talking with the DNR about some of the parameters with that program. There's some things that have to be worked out and we know um, historically this has been something that will have to be a discussion with the county board as to whether or not this is something they wanna pursue for compliance. I see Jake shaking his head. He can probably give more background there. <laughs> um, we know this has been a discussion for the county board in the past. So this is as we try to implement some of the recommendations that are being put forward, we will be having those conversations with county board again to see what they want us to pursue. But water quality trading credits do have some benefits in the sense that they might be the most cost effective for the county in the near term and also with the ability to possibly use agricultural credits there could be sort of a win-win that we could be doing um, projects within the Fenwood that could then be used to get the credits we need within REACH 154 to meet <coughs> compliance. So there's opportunities to achieve possibly multiple goals. The ultimate uh, reduction that we do need to achieve is 42.7 pounds. The way Strand has outlined the timeline for us, you'll see that uh, the DNR is asking for the initial 4.3 pounds to come by 2030. There's definitely no harm in achieving our reduction ahead of schedule. And the way they've also outlined the timeline, they're just suggesting sometimes that they're putting something in the timeline to suggest when we apply for a grant based on the Wisconsin DNR's grant cycle. So sometimes you'll see something in the proposed timeline ahead of the 2030, just so that we can be in line to get the funds we need to do some of these projects. As it relates to some of the other projects that Strand is recommending, there are partner elements to these projects as well, including working with Weston and Wausau and Statine. So these are going to be implementation conversations we're gonna have to have as well, but they are also going to need to achieve reductions. So there's a benefit for them wanting to pursue these projects as well. Um, Marathon Park 
has a project listed in this list of recommendations as well, and we have been in contact with Jamie and discussion of the West Side Master Plan to make sure the two efforts are coordinated going forward so that if we're going to do developments within Marathon Park, um, we pursue the, the wet pond in conjunction with that so that we would get what we need for the stormwater reduction, but also meet West Side Master Plan's goals. Jeff, would you like to add anything else? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, as uh, Lori mentioned, there are uh, alternating periods for planning grants and for construction grants. So part of the timing would be to, uh, one, coordinate with other communities to achieve their water quality standards as well. And we could also, in that process, um, then apply for construction grants through DNR to help develop that type of project so it mitigates our, our overall costs as in terms of partners. So the area, um, e each project has some, some, I should say, some interesting elements because where most of our um, um, stormwater related areas are tied to or are located within an urban or another MS4 community. So we'll have to coordinate with Wausau, for example. We'll have to coordinate with Weston. We'll have to coordinate with other, other communities, Statine as, as an example, uh, over time. So of course, when you're dealing with other units of government, that adds another layer that you have to work through. But we have multiple, multiple years to, to achieve this. I would like to note also, too, that uh, this is tied to uh, the uh, 2019 total maximum daily load study. And what that document did, it identified our rivers that are what's called 303D listed. In other words, they're impaired waterways. We have 231 river miles in Marathon County that's considered impaired, mostly by phosphorus. Uh, so some of the reductions that we could possibly achieve, we could we could work with our rural uh, community to help offset and achieve uh, goals in reduction of phosphorus so that we can, reach, we can uh, meet our uh, stream reach improvements in terms of the reduction of 42 pounds, uh, as well as help the more rural side. So the TMDL runs on five-year permit periods. Uh, and um, I think we're in actually really good shape for our MS4 area, um, but there's another avenue, if you will, that we have to travel and improve our stormwater and water quality conditions in our rural side. So, and that's dictated by US EPA, DNR, and the TMDL. If you have any questions, I, hopefully I can answer and respond to any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I hate, I'm just wondering where this phosphorus all comes from. I mean, if it's, there's no cows there, right? <laughs> well, that's a, that's a loaded question, so to speak. It, you know, it's, it, it's a complicated thing because it's also naturally occurring. It's a necessary element. You need phosphorus to, to grow plants, et cetera. It's a fertilizer. It's also a nutrient. If you use too much phosphorus, then it's, we get fish kills. We get low dissolved oxygen and Old Plain, right? So we've just funded a aerator system in the Old Plain Reservoir. Uh, and so it's it's not a, a one silver bullet, one problem source, so to speak. It's non-point, that's why I call it non-point. And we are all striving to work to achieve water quality standards, whether you're in an urban area or a rural area. Just like, a question, are there ed any educational programs that are, I guess, uh, focused on urban areas that like City of Wassa residents or whatever know about? I haven't seen much published about that. You know, f the use of fertilizers on your lawn or, or whatever, that's not being stressed that you should change from that. They've got the no grow, you know, May, but that's one month. E e e yeah. So it's stuff like that. Is there anything that can be... I re really 
you know, something that this is an issue, we need to deal with it, let's do it? it yes, and in fact, most oftentimes, for example, uh, the city of Wausau, they will incorporate stormwater BNP practices within projects, new projects. Whether it's uh, design standards, if it's uh, um, stormwater best management practices that they can incorporate into their projects, oftentimes um, they will coordinate with the stormwater coalition. So on our web website or our data, we are through the um, RPC, local RPC. So if you wanted to find more information about stormwater, stormwater elements, the TMDL, uh, salt usage, you name it, um, public education for all the six minimum requirements that's necessary to improve your stormwater controls. Um, it's located on that particular website. So if you go to um, the regionals RPC, go to uh, just navigate through that and you'll get to our stormwater uh, site. And we it's brand new, so there's all kinds of great information on it. We do, um, on an annual basis, try to inform and better educate people. Sometimes that's easier said than done. We do go to schools and provide um, information in terms of stormwater control. How do you control phosphorus inputs? How do you control stormwater? Different ways, different methodologies, rain gardens, rain barrels. Uh, you name it, there's a, there's a whole list. Um, and we do provide uh, PSAs. So we just had a PSA out for salt, and we just had a, a PSA that, well, should be coming up this month for rubber ducky. Uh, so you'll see that during your news. So if you watch news, uh, you'll see that uh, rubber ducky video. But it also refers you back to the Stormwater Coalition website, uh, which provides better information. And then also each local unit of government that's at MS4 also has to, should be providing public education elements to their citizens as well. I, I guess I just haven't heard about it. You know, you hear about the, when I was on the city council, I mean, we talked about the stormwater management as, as far as the, the street cleaning and, and things like that. But on a personal basis, for the average homeowner, it's not out there. And like I do, I fertilize my lawn or whatever, but there's no education out there to say, this is, you know, I, I am surprised to see the city, the metro area listed worse than an urban area when I know how much is flowing into the, uh, you know, the, the Lake Wasser area and their, the difficulties there. So, Really, we've got more issues in the city dealing with this right now than we, we are regulated right. more um, through DNR and US EPA in the urban areas. Right? But I think it's worthy of even in the city newsletter to get something in there to say this is an issue right now. We need to reduce, and what can you do as an individual landowner? Uh, in a concentrated area, what can you do to stop, you know, help with this? And I think you'd get some, I think you'd have a response yeah, to help with that. Yeah, we've tried to go also coordinate with, um, we have membership from Merrill all the way down to Baraboo. And we try to coordinate also with uh, the chambers of commerce and, and try to go through them as well. Uh, each municipal unit of government generally has a website, so they'll they'll post information on the website. Um, some communities, Marshfield, for example, we had an exhibit that we helped pay for, um, the coalition did, um, to inform the general public, so that's a pretty broad reach, it was at their zoo. Um, we do fund rain gardens throughout uh, the area, the region. Typically, it's uh, been funding for schools. Um, and uh, the information's out there. I, 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 what I'm hearing from you is we need to get it out there in terms of where mm -hmm. is it located better. Yeah, and easy to find. Right. Yeah, it's readily available and 
I like rain gardens. I think that could be a real good effort uh, for private landowners. It, it, and oddly enough, not only are they useful in terms of stormwater control, but they're if they're done well, yeah. they're very visually visually pleasing. Um, okay. Uh, so I guess that question was more in regards to the outreach and how that information gets to people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, do we have anywhere on the county website that we put any of this information on to? I'm sure the plans are available somewhere. Uh, the TMDL uh, is on uh, the Stonewater uh, website. Um, it's a direct link to DNR. I don't think it's, it's so large, I don't think we could house it and, and have it uh, navigated very easily by the general public on our site. Sure. Um, we, uh, could you repeat that, just so I'm confirming what... So like to Supervisor Orbeck's point, if, if that information is something that could help out residents in the area and they could adopt certain practices to mitigate that phosphorus, is there, beyond the, the outreach campaign, so to speak, where you're mm -hmm. putting information out there, is there, where are they, maybe a better way to put it, Jeff, is where are they directed to once they get presented that information, okay. right? Because if people want to learn more, then how are they directed to, sorry, what resource are they directed to? That's what I'm trying to ask. Okay. We do have um, information on our current website through CPZ. Um, in terms of stormwater phase two elements, that is still directed to the RPC site. Our plan, once it's a, if it's approved uh, and, and completed by DNR, uh, that would be, we'll post that on our county website. Okay. Okay. Anything else? Any other questions? Mr. 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 Back. I think I just had a question. Is there some way that the, you could put this out there where they'd be tripping over it a little bit instead of, I mean, instead of having to go look for it. Um, so just a thought there. I, I think, I mean, I think with the new website, there's options to definitely highlight things as need be too, um, as we want to get new messages out there and things related to stormwater management. So, but. The, this group's website, is that what I'm hearing? Or well, the... so right now you can get to the Stormwater Coalition through CPZ's website. With my understanding of the new website that we're developing for Marathon County is there will be ways to bring, highlight certain things, bring them to the forefront as we want, like sort of um, <laughs> hot topics, so, you know, <laughs> and that those topics will rotate out. <laughs> I didn't realize we were getting a new website, so. <laughs> it's been in process. Okay. <laughs> I didn't realize I, it wasn't no. <laughs> oh. Maybe one of the things we could do is like what we talked about in the NC or the, the North Central Health Care meeting is over the top uh, advertising where you buy fertilizer, you get hit with phosphorus ads about how to treat it on your television through streaming services because that's what's happening out there right now is what you do triggers what you see on TV now. Thank you, Chair. Uh, which to Supervisor Overbeck's uh, comment is is a little little scary, but uh, nonetheless very true. Uh, you know what we've been talking about here is all all good, but it it sort of relies on the individual going out and seeking this information. And and my understanding of part of this problem, and it's just a a partial understanding, I'm sure, is that, you know, one of the, the key components to the problem is the fact that, you know, residential landowners are, are a huge component of that because we are the heaviest users typically of fertilizers, you know, per pound per acre than, than anything else. You know, we, we even outstrip the golf courses. Uh, you know, so in that line, uh, Perhaps one of the outreach processes could be, and I don't know how this would be done, but you know we're competing against the barrage of advertising from every every uh, uh, you know home improvement store, anybody that's selling lawn fertilizer, et cetera, et cetera. You know, 
maybe part of that public service announcement needs to be some type of of signage, perhaps, that, you know, hey, Mr. Consumer, Ms. Consumer, stop, step back, look at what you're proposing to buy, and look at what your actual usage is versus what perhaps it should be and what the consequences of excess usage are. You know, you may not realize your runoff goes directly to the Wisconsin River, even though you're like, well, wait a second, I'm four blocks away. You know, you may not realize it, but, you know, it seems like rather than relying on people going to our website, which is a conscious thing that they need to do, you know, and who has the extra time, how do we get this information in front of them in a way that when they're actually going to be contributing to the problem because they're going to buy phosphorus, you know, then they see that type of information. Just a thought. I guess uh, the, the one thing I'll I'll add to this, and don't get me wrong, I I trust that staff will uh, develop the campaign and take the feedback from the committee and, and put something together. Um, I mean, we do have a communications officer. I'm sure Jeff, you could work with them in order to put something together for that to engage the news media, see if they'd be willing to do a story or something on it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, we have had some recent news coverage, if you will, uh, for some of the salt events that that we put on. So hopefully that made the news and caught the attention of of some individuals. But you know, it's. Stormwater is just not sexy, right? <laughs> I, I hate to say it, you're talking phosphorus and pollutants and loadings and construction site management and BMPs and you know, all these things that are regulated, if you will. Um, so it, it's, it's a tough animal to get out there and uh, mm -hmm. get people's attention, true attention of, regarding it. However, it is uh, a very important issue, as, as everyone knows, right? Water and water quality, whether it's surface or groundwater, is very important. If you pollute it, it you, you, we will have a direct impact and a direct effect on what we can and cannot do, and it affects our health, it affects our businesses, it affects everything that, about us, right? Mm -hmm. In every way. So it's an important issue. Um, but it's, I, I would concur that it would be, perhaps we could coordinate with uh, uh, our, our communications officer and see if we can do a better job getting this information out. Sure. And, so it, over back. and it might be the right time because of all the media attention to what's happening out west with the water, you know, no water or bad water and what's happening out there. So I, I think everybody's thinking about this and it's becoming a worldwide discussion as far as where, where water is good, where it is bad, and where people are going to migrate to in the future. And water is gonna be a big issue as far as <coughs> white communities you know, prosper. So I, I think that's a, it's getting to a point where People got to start thinking about this. I, I, I'll just add one additional thing. It's more for everyone's thoughts, right, and, and consideration in terms of perspective, right? So we're in a very rural, open, undeveloped community, Marathon County. We have some municipalities that have developed and they're developing. The world that I came from uh, was highly urbanized, uh, lots of stormwater issues, um, pollutants from industries, uh, on and on and on. They have, where I've spent between, or lived between the city of Akron and the city of Cleveland, they have spent six, in excess of six billion dollars regarding stormwater related issues. We can save a ton of money if we're preventative in our process rather than having the problem be created and then have to spend that kind of money in retrofits. So it's, we're in a good position really uh, and particularly with our MS4, I mean we have my lord, 46 pounds we have to worry about, or 42 pounds. So we're, we're really in good shape in our urban areas, in better shape than most of our surrounding 
urbanized areas, uh, but we also have to look at it as a holistic uh, system, uh, more so than just simply the MS4 area as well. Okay. Uh, that being said, we'll be seeing this information in the future, I believe. Yeah, so yeah. Strand will be doing a, a larger presentation the to county the county board. board in April, and then as we start to pursue some of the implementation recommendations, there'll be future conversation with the county board um, related to that, you know, over the next several years. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, item 6-5, and uh, help, I need an attorney. Um, so that says load program. I think it's supposed to be loan program. Yeah. Can we talk about that, or...? I think I was thinking of total, total maximum daily load. Yeah. <laughs> or just leave it Y. Everyone's looking in my direction. Um, I'll give you my two cents. It's on for education. You would ask for an update on the Pouts loan program and kind of our next steps. We're not asking for any action. You're not legally permitted to take any action today. Um, I'm comfortable with the spelling error to move forward. The, um, and we can give future updates at, at a later date. We envision doing that. Um, but we just wanted to at least make sure we gave you kind of the rundown of the events since your last two meetings where we provided you uh, information regarding our efforts to get that agreement in place with McDevco. Uh, so you're saying, Lance, because no, since there'd be no action taken that? The, the entire, the point of, um, certainly the point of Wisconsin's open meetings law is to put the public on notice as to any action that may be taking place. You're not taking action. In fact, the action with respect to the county board and the pouts the personal on-site wastewater treatment system loan program that you envisioned, I think was taken, Lori, correct me if I'm wrong, but it like 2019? Yeah, in 2018, 20, no, it was 2018, the county board passed a resolution directing the administrator to set up this program with McDevco. So we, we already have our action or our marching orders as it relates to the loan program. We're just kind of giving you guys an update of what's going on because we've been trying to renegotiate or relaunch it, shall, shall we say, so. Yeah. <laughs> um, one second. So, yeah, go ahead, provide the update, so. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's an educational update just to, I mean, so as we've already said, for background for the newer members, in 2018, $650,000 of the Environmental Impact Fund was put aside directing the administrator to set up a loan program for the private on-site wastewater treatment systems for landowners. It was originally um, something to help supplement the the lapse, the projected lapse that was going to come from the Wisconsin Fund Grant Program. Uh, with COVID and some other uh, delays, it never really got set up. So we went back to the drawing board over the last several months with McDevco to come up with new guidance as it relates to giving out these loans. And so we, we we're still fine tuning certain aspects of it, but we are ready to go forward with a year long agreement with McDevco to get this off the ground this year. Um, and start trying to test out giving out loans to landowners. Um, I'll let Lance add anything else he wants to add as it relates to that as well, so. Sure, thanks, uh, Lori. The only other thing I'll indicate, and Lori made reference to this, the county board gave very clear direction in 2018. Um, again, this was to kind of fill the gap that was believed to be coming with the Wisconsin fund ending. Now, this Wisconsin fund was kept around for a bit longer than uh, was originally anticipated, but nevertheless, it is anticipated that it will not continue. So we're getting this loan program put in place. And while the resolution from the county board did say work specifically with McDevco, it identified them as the only enti the entity that the, the administrator was to work to put this together with. I just want you to know that we did 
you know, making sure that we're being good stewards of tax dollars. We did reach out to, we got a, uh, a kind of a quote from McDevco as to what it would cost to operate the program. We did our due diligence to reach out to some potential other uh, vendors that might be able to uh, either be interested in this space or be able to provide it. Um, and I just wanted to give you an update. I'm fairly confident that if we didn't go with McDevco, this would not be up and running for this building season. Um, so I think moving forward with McDevco is a uh, is a very prudent course of uh, direction in light of the fact that I think the value of this is getting it done promptly and having it available for landowners this building season. Um, and also that uh, one of the other nonprofits that we reached out to really, we haven't been able to identify anyone else that is really overly interested in putting together this loan program. We have an entity that could do grants but of course the difference between a grant program and a loan program is a grant program doesn't kind of perpetuate itself. This idea is the loan funds as they come back to the loan fund could be lent out to additional landowners. So we are asking McDevco to do more work. So that's why the um, program is gonna be set up that way. And it does come at a cost, um, but McDevco is fairly active in that space as you all know with respect to economic development from Marathon County, and they operate our loan fund, our revolving loan fund, the gap financing program. They operate a similar fund uh, for the city of Wausau, and really those agreements are somewhat similar. Happy to answer any questions, but uh, that's kind of where we're at. Uh, we should have that hopefully finished up relatively soon. Okay, questions? All right, thank you. Uh, seven, policy issues, discussion, potential committee determination, none. Eight, next meeting, May 2nd, 2023, 3 p.m., assembly room and future agenda items. A, committee members are asked to bring ideas for future discussion. B, announcements, request correspondence. One, request for ERC representation on the 1204 administrators group. And since it's the administrators group, I bet you that's the administrator. No? I put this back on the agenda, actually, and yeah, yeah, maybe Lance didn't know I put it on there. <laughs> Um, so we are trying to get representation from each of the county committees to update the assembly's ordinance and uh, I believe ERC is the one committee we're missing representation from at this time so I think we have gotten responses from all the other committees so I just want I think Lance had sent out an email I want to say earlier this year requesting for a volunteer but, yeah it was either earlier this year or late last year but I think it was earlier this year and it's not every committee but the standing committees that really were kind of most involved or most had some relationship with this idea of regulating assemblies. Again, Marathon County does have a large assembly ordinance. It is section 12.04 of your ordinance code. Um, so working with public safety and also with uh, infrastructure, the idea being that uh, those committees, for example, the highway department, if there's a triathlon they may be asked to uh, set up barricades or close off certain sections of county roadway that would incur a cost that's what really spurred this discussion quite a number of years ago about updating our ordinance uh, to address you know what sort of ordinances uh, excuse me what sort of assemblies are we regulating and how are we doing that what sort of policy exists with respect to cost recovery because of course having county staff undertake those activities comes at a cost and it's kind of outside what you'd normally expect in terms of government service. Similarly with law enforcement, if you think about that triathlon or that marathon, you frequently see law enforcement officers uh, standing at various intersections, directing traffic or um, making sure that the, the event is moving safely. The idea of what does that look like to engage law enforcement? What's our process look like? Who oversees the uh, review of those uh, applications. That ordinance needs to be up updated. Corporation Council gave a presentation at uh, the Infrastructure Committee about some of the concerns, the legal concerns uh, that exist with respect to that ordinance. Um, and then of course why I'd be seeking some input from this group. It certainly relates very closely to zoning. And in fact you did, uh, this committee did move forward to the County Board and the County Board did approve some changes with respect to your zoning ordinance, but there were specific changes as it related to assemblies and various aspects of uh, those sort of events that action was deferred upon and having representation from this group 
involved in that, uh, what I'm calling a work group as opposed to a task force, um, would be helpful because I think there are policy uh, determinations that need to be made and I don't want to have staff be moving forward those things to the county board without really direction from uh, leadership of the board. Happy to answer any questions, but that's kind of where we're at at this point. Um, and then I'll. I think because it's. I think it's because it's under here. We'll just say the the request is for someone to participate. From Correct. Here. Okay. Uh, e two request for ERC representation on the groundwater work group. Yes. Yeah, so we are going to start this month. Uh, we started to pull together representatives for a groundwater work group. To, related to rolling out the testing portion. So that is the first part of getting the groundwater plan updated is we're going to begin well testing later this year. So we've been amassing um, some experts and some other people to help us figure out how we're going to actually roll this process out. And we would like to have representation from the ERC at some of these discussions as well. Our first meeting is going to be April 17th. I do not remember the time off the top of my head, but it would be uh, virtual attendance is definitely Definitely uh, an option here. So, okay. And we're thinking of meeting about once a month through the summer as uh, we're targeting starting to sample wells probably late July, early August. Is so we we need some guidance in terms of how we roll some of this out. <laughs> so. Okay. Uh, and then B three upcoming joint finance committee hearing and Fenwood testimony. Yeah. So I wanted to give you all an update related to the Fenwood um, pilot that. In April of 2021, the executive committee did give direction to CPZ to continue to seek funding as and, and through all avenues, I should say, anywhere possible to get that Fenwood pilot funded and up and running. Uh, we had an event for the Eau Plaine Partnership for Integrated Conservation, I think two Thursdays ago, out, um, out where what where the heck was it? I cannot remember. <laughs> it was two Thursdays ago. But we had our, our event called Common Ground that I sent you all an invite to. And we had representation from uh, Senator James, Representative Rosar, and Representative Shanklin there. And following that event, they actually started uh, circulating um, emails to get co-sponsorship to introduce a bill to fund the Fenwood pilot in Marathon County. So that co-sponsorship request ended last Friday. So sometime this week or next week, they will be introducing a bill uh, to fund a pilot here in Marathon County. And they have asked our county, county conservationist to be available to testify when they're ready to start having those hearings. So she'll probably be going down there in the next couple weeks. And so we just wanted to keep you all updated to that effort. So. Okay. All right. Nine. Let's go. I'll make a motion we adjourn. Motion by Seafell. Second by Little. I'm sorry, we I had a request, but have you got a way moving on? Oh no, you can make a request. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Can go I ahead. Do so okay. yeah, we'll 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 circle back. Go ahead. All right. Sorry about that. No, you're good. Mike. Yep. Please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sorry, like I say, I'm really sorry about this. I know I know you wanted to get home and yeah. But it'd be nice. Yeah. Um, I was just one back on these resolutions that we were doing that the towns send us. Mm -hmm. um, those questions on there, I see. Is there some confusion with the people who write those that are sometimes they have no, and then sometimes they have yes, and then some of the ones are just not available. I'm just wondering if those could be worded a little different, or at least put a, you know, it's a matter of how you read them. Are you referring to the county zone town resolutions? The, the, yeah, the resolution zoning ornaments amendment. It's called. Um, yeah. It's a, one is on page sixty. I'll just on. The, and I wasn't complaining about that. I was just questioning the fact that those some of the questions are a little hard to understand for the people, maybe. So, because how our meeting was noticed today, I guess we'll just say. Um, Take a look and yep. get back to you. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. And okay. my other request is, I'd like to be off next month. I'd like to be a you student. Gotta submit your <laughs> PTO papers or what? <laughs> you will be marked excused, I'm guessing. Thank you. Okay, that's what I figured. All right, number nine. Uh, Chair Gibbs. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just like to draw everybody's attention to I know we had a public comment about solar and wind farms, or more specifically, wind farms. 
Um, Otola's law firm uh, held two seminars, uh, one uh, February 22nd, uh, 2023, and one just yesterday, uh, a continuation of that um, on uh, solar, and those materials can be viewed uh, and view the hour-long discussion on what the county's role is on, uh, you know, regulating those, uh, and specifically on the one that's proposed in the part of Marathon County that's uh, 100 megawatts. I would uh, recommend that each of you uh, take the time to review those. Go to the WCA website, go to uh, events, and go to past events materials, and you'll be able to find both of those links to both of the, uh, the two web uh, webinars that uh, addressed uh, the legal issues on that. Um. All right. Anybody else? Nine. All right, sorry. Okay, Supervisor Rader, did you have to make a motion to adjourn? Okay, motion is made. Second by Supervisor Rader. Any further discussion? Seeing, hearing none. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Thank you, everybody.